Welcome to Textbook Engineering Problem, where we explore complex engineering problems and discuss different methods for solving them. In this video, I'll be breaking down a problem and discussing different ways to tackle it. However, keep in mind that there is no one correct path for some of these solutions, and I encourage you to share your own insights and thoughts in the comments. Together, we can learn and improve our problem-solving skills. So, sit back, grab a notebook, and let's dive into today's problem. Alright, so today we're working out of Elementary Principles of Chemical Processes, 3rd edition, and I had a request to do problem number 4.15 from the next chapter than the one I've been working on. Um, so I'll go ahead and work through this problem and give you my take on it. Okay, so I'll read the problem statement. A liquid mixture contains 60 weight percent ethanol, E, 5 weight percent of a dissolved solute, S, and the balance water. A stream of this mixture is fed into a continuous distillation column operating at steady state. Product streams emerge at the top and bottom of the column. The column design will calls for the product streams to have equal mass flow rates and for the top stream to contain 90 weight percent ethanol and no solute. Part A. Assume a basis of calculation. Draw and fully label a process flowchart. Do the degree of freedom analysis and verify that all unknown stream flows and compositions can be calculated. Don't do any calculations yet. Okay, so we're doing a degree of freedom analysis. Move that out of the way. And uh, in order to do that, degrees of freedom is equal to the number of unknowns minus the number of independent equations in this instance. Okay, so I went through and I highlighted all of the unknowns in yellow and all of the independent equations in red. Okay, so and you can go through and you can count all the spots that are yellow and I think that's pretty easy to see that all those are unknown um, and then we can go through and count all the red ones that are known. Let me help define some of those. So. So each one, of the, each one of the red unknowns here, especially count these three, you get one independent equation for each mass balance of each species that you can do. So you see here I highlighted um, each one of those species to say we have three equations, independent equations that we can do. So one, two, three. Then we have the, um, the logic here that says um, each one of these weight fractions has to add up to one. So that's a constraint on the process, and that's true for each of these streams. So we have three more there. And then in the problem statement, they gave us that mass two is equal to mass three. Um, so that is uh, seven independent equations, okay? I'm gonna assume a basis of 200 grams, kilograms per hour. You can see that I wrote that right there. So when I do all of my calculations, anything that has to do with the total mass flow rate, it's based on a 200 kilogram per hour mass flow rate. And you'll see in a little bit why I chose 200. It's because you split these streams up equally, then each one of those streams will have 100 kilograms per hour flow rate. So it makes the math a little bit easier. Okay. Part B. Calculate 1, the mass fraction of S in the bottom stream, and 2, the fraction of ethanol in the feed that leaves in the bottom product stream, i.e. kilograms of ethanol in bottom stream per kilogram ethanol in feed, if the process operates as designed. Okay, so it says what is the mass fraction of the solute in stream three? And what is this ratio equal to? Okay, let's do this one first, the, uh, the weight fraction of solute. And before we get into the mass balance of the solute, let's calculate a few things that we do know. Like I just said before, each of these streams is equal to 100 kilograms. We know that because the mass of flow one should equal the the mass going in should equal the mass going out. So we got that there. Um, we know 
they gave to us that mass flow rate 2 is equal to mass flow rate 3. So, so through substitution and addition, we can calculate those quantities. Okay. The other thing that we know um, for stream 1 and stream 2, they gave us enough information to say um, what the mass fractions are in those instances because we know that this is our other independent equation which applies to both or all three streams. Okay, so we have 1 minus mass fraction ethanol 1, mass fraction solute 1 equals mass fraction of water 1, so we know the mass fraction of water there. Mass fraction of ethanol 2, solute 2 equals mass fraction of water in stream 2, so now we have mass fraction of water stream 2. Okay, now that we got those out of the way, let's move on to our mass balance of solute. Okay, mass balance of solute, we know that the mass of solute going in has to equal the mass of solute going out. So see here we know that uh, the amount of mass in stream 2 is 0 uh, for the solute. Um, so the mass fraction is 0, so that means we have this relationship here. And we can solve for the mass fraction of solute in stream 3, 0.1. Okay, and that's the answer to, or one of the answers to part B. Now let's do the mass balance on stream, on the ethanol. Okay, same kind of thing. We have mass going in equals mass of ethanol going out. 200 times 0 0.6 going in, that's uh, 120. Then we have these going out, 90 going out of the top and then we need to figure out how much is going out the bottom. We're left with just one variable there, so let's solve for the weight fraction of ethanol going out the bottom, which is 30 divided by 100, and that equals 0 0.3. Okay, now we have the ingredients we need, the weight fractions in stream three um, and stream one in order to calculate the ethanol fractions that they wanted us to calculate. So we've got our mass flow rates of ethanol in stream three over mass flow rate of ethanol in stream one. Break those up into what we know. Those are the numbers, and we're left with 0 0.25 as, the math, as a fraction of recovery. Now let's do part C. An analyzer is available to determine the composition of ethanol water mixtures. The calibration curve for the analyzer is a straight line on a plot on logarithmic axes of mass fraction of ethanol, X, versus analyzer reading, R. The line passes through the points R equals 15, X equals 0 0.1, and R equals 38, X equals 0 0.4. Derive an expression for X as a function of R based on the calibration and use it to determine the value of R that should be obtained if the top product stream from the distillation column is analyzed. Okay, so they gave us these two points right here, and then they said what's, what should R equal if X is equal to 0 0.9? The other thing that they gave to us is they said, okay, the log axes are straight line. So that means if you have a log relationship that it will have a straight line here. So this is kind of like y log r equals m, which is our slope, x, which is a log weight fraction, plus b, or our intercept, log a. Okay, so this is a typical log relationship. It looks like a straight line when you log it. And we've done that a lot in chapter Two. So if you are unfamiliar with how to break this up and do a log axis straight line um, relationship, then go back to chapter two and watch some of those videos. And um, I think a more majority of those videos uh, have this kind of relationship. So just kind of peruse through one of those problems in your book and pull one out that asks about a log re relationship, and then you can check out my video um, that, that kind of helps explain how to do that, break that up into a log relationship. Okay, um, so let's move this out of the way a little bit. Okay, so they said determine the 
parameters of our model. Okay, so we have one parameter here, which is log A, and the other parameter is log B, the, the slope and the intercept. It's lucky that they gave us uh, two points. That's why they gave you the two points and not one point, because how many lines can you draw through a single point? An infinite number. How many lines can you draw through two points? Just one. Okay, so that's why you need the two points, so you can draw a single line through those two points. And that means you have a system of equations. Two equations, two equations, and two unknowns. The two equations are given to us by the two points that they gave to us, and the two unknowns are log A and B. Okay, so system of equations, n equals 2. We can calculate what log A and log B are using any number of uh, methods from linear algebra. You can use um, substitution method, you can use uh, matrix method, uh, whatever you end up using is whatever you guys can you guys know how to solve these kind of problems i believe um if you don't um i can make a video on how to solve some of these um otherwise uh otherwise um yeah just leave something in the comment if you need extra help with that okay um so this is what log a equals for this system and this is what b equals for this system okay so in the circumstances where log a equals this and log b equals this then we just plug in our 0 0.9 back into our equation here, and we can solve for what log r is if, if x equals 0 0.9. And then we can solve for r. Make sure you change it back into r instead of log r, because when you use this equation, you get log r, not r. Okay, so r should equal 65.4, because, because 0.9 is the composition of ethanol in stream 2. Okay, now let's go to part D. Suppose a sample of the top stream is taken and analyzed and the reading obtained is not the one calculated in part C. Assume that the calculation in part C is correct and that the plant operator followed the correct procedure in doing the analysis. Give five significantly different possible causes for the deviation between our measured R and the predicted value of R, including several assumptions made when writing the balances of Part C. For each one, suggest something that the operator could do to check whether it is, in fact, the problem. Okay, so we've got our first thing that I thought of was, okay, the composition of the inlet stream is not correct. Maybe we actually have less ethanol in the inlet than we thought. Well, then you're going to get less ethanol in the exiting stream in the top as well, and the composition will be skewed a little bit differently. Okay, so that's one reason why it could be wrong. Um, something the operator could do to check is he could just check the ethanol composition in stream one. There you go. No problem. Okay. Number two, I thought of, okay, maybe there's a, a accumulation inside of your distillation column. Maybe you're working with gases and, uh, and something in the process has occurred in which now you're accumulating mass inside of your distillation column instead of having it exit equally, inlet equals outlet. Okay, so something you could check if that was the case then there would there should be a pressure gauge on your um, distillation column and you should be able to check the pressure the operator should be able to check the pressure in the reactor if you're accumulating mass in there then the pressure has to increase okay so he could check for something like that part three we could say okay here's another instance where um, we assumed that m2 equals m3 um, well, maybe uh, M2 doesn't equal M3, and there's a process leak in stream number four. You know, so there's only two streams exiting. What if there was a fourth stream exiting and we didn't realize it? Like there's a crack in the bottom of the distillation column or something like that. Um, well, then there's an extra stream four, and uh, and we're leaking some some uh, pressure or leaking some mass out of that. Well, you're gonna get uh, different. Uh, composition in your streams going out because you've got an extra stream there. Okay, so now let's do number four. What if one of the streams, the exit streams, was plugged? Well, let's say you have a plug in the bottom stream. What's going to happen to stream two? Well, you're going to start, if 
you're restricting the flow in uh, in uh, stream number three, then you're going to be forcing some extra non-volatiles out the top. Okay, so um, and then the same thing goes with the other one. All right, and something the operator could do to check this is he could check to see what the mass flow rate is in uh, stream two and three and one and try and close that mass balance and say like, okay, we'll look at these flow meters and say, okay, is the flow meter on stream one, two, and three, are they all adding up to be the same flow that sh it should be? Um, if it's not, then, um, then it's operating out of the design. All right, so number five is the reactor or the distillation column is not at steady state. Okay, so you just started up this react or this uh, distillation column, and there are still flows kind of oscillating within the vessel there. So um, right when you start things up, uh, it can take quite a while for, especially if the equipment is very large, it can take a long time for the uh, setup to come to steady state. So um, that's one thing you can do to monitor um, the design and monitor to see if your uh, vessel has come to steady state is uh, by testing the different flows. You can test your um, your different flow rates. You can test the compositions and say, okay, are we at steady state yet? And it should approach steady state and, and what we solve for is the steady state condition. Um, so. So it will gradually approach steady state, and then you'll know um, when you reach there. If you continue to see kind of wild oscillations um, when you're taking these measurements, then you'll know, hey, something's not right. It's it's having a hard time reaching steady state. Something's going wrong with the feed or something along those lines. If it's taking too long, um, just go through and check all of your measurements, see if there's something wasn't put back right, or see if somebody left a wrench in the in the machine you're working on, you know, any number of things can go wrong when you take a process down and then try and bring it back up. So um, lots of things you'll have to go over and make sure that everything was kind of set back the way that it should have been. Maybe somebody left a valve closed that they shouldn't be closed or something like that. Anyway, things you can check. All right, that is it for problem number 4.15. Thank you for watching, and I hope you found this video helpful in your problem-solving journey. Remember, there are other routes you can take to arrive at the same correct answer, and I encourage you to leave a comment with any additional insights or questions you may have. Also, if you have any specific engineering problems you would like me to cover, please let me know in the comments. Your feedback is valuable, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more engineering problem-solving videos. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video.